Hello and welcome to NOV Live. I'm Michael Gaines, host of the podcast NOV Today, and uh, glad that you are here joining us for another episode. Uh, we are looking forward to a great show and uh, and going to have some good content and conversation uh, around uh, digital engineering and uh, the idea of how, how do you use data well? How do you make good decisions using data uh, with a focus on completions? So uh, to help us talk through that, our special guests today are Noah Buck, who is a uh, business development manager within the intervention and stimulation equipment business unit here at NOV, and also Charles Pope, who is the founder of Complete Shale. So we'll be getting to both of those guys in just a moment. Uh, and of course, as always with me, I have uh, Shelby Dumain, who is the social media manager here at NOV. So Shelby, glad that you are here. How you doing? Today, as always, um, the great thing about going live that, that I want to mention is that we can take questions throughout the show. So at any point, you watching at home, whether you're on Facebook, YouTube, or LinkedIn, comment any questions you have for our guests, and, uh, and we'll get to as many questions and get to as many comments as we can which speaking of comments, uh, we it is time for this week's Rig Geek Post of the Week. Rig Geek's Post of the Week. All right, so if any of you have tuned in before or if this is your first time, I'll explain a little bit what this segment is all about. Uh, we ask uh, some fun tri trivia questions about different tech or equipment across the industry. And uh, we, we asked these to see if any of our rig geeks that follow us, if you know the answer. So this week, we're going to show, um, pull an image up now. And um, our question for this week is, how long is the average coiled tubing unit string? Uh, if you think you know the answer, how long is the average coiled tubing unit string? If you think you know, you can go ahead and comment it in the, in the comments, again, on Facebook, LinkedIn, or YouTube. And uh, we're going to be looking, checking those out, seeing uh, as the guesses come in what everyone thinks. And then at the end of the show, we're actually going to reveal uh, the answer. So stay tuned for that to see if you uh, if you got the got it right. All right, looking forward to those uh, answers. And again, as always, uh, if you use the hashtag Rig Geeks, uh, we look forward to seeing your guesses. And we'll come back to Shelby at the end of the program. All right, so as we mentioned, we're talking about uh, digital data, or excuse me, data, but also digital engineering and uh, the concept of, of using and utilizing uh, data to, to make good decisions, uh, especially when we're looking at the completion space. So uh, to maybe give us a little uh, groundwork and to start the conversation, I wanna head over to Noah Buck, who is uh, the business development manager within the Eyes Business Unit. So, hey, Noah, good to see you. Morning, Michael. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. So, so help us understand this this concept of of, of data and how how we can utilize it and how how you see that. Well, for over a couple of decades now, uh, NOV uh, has been a leader in the uh, digital acquisition space uh, on both the rig side and the intervention simulation equipment side, certainly. Um, and the way that we have been able to achieve efficiencies and, and build those blocks towards uh, achieving uh, more cost-effective outcomes have been through uh, connecting operations data from the field, um, applying it to uh, engineering tools, uh, software like uh, Cerberus is a suite of uh, engineering products and helping deliver that to uh, our customers uh, integrated and uh, online in real time. Okay. So when you're, when you're looking at that and, and so you're talking about, you know, utilizing the data, use, using it in real time. I mean, what, what are some of the, the major considerations that have driven progress and, and innovation in this space? You know, quite a lot of it has had to do with the fact that better documentation has led to better understanding of uh, what it is that's going on on the well site. Uh, being able to properly uh, match up what the procedure is to achieve a job with uh, what's measured to be uh, going on uh, at the uh, uh, during the job or after the job. Uh, but that being said, uh, when you've got this information available to you uh, in real time, you then have the ability to uh, or have an opportunity to rather um, overlay that with your engineering products and get real time feedback to drive better decision making. OK, um, and so it's an interesting point. I want to pivot over to Charles Pope again, who's the founder 
of uh, Complete Shale. So Charles, I know that uh, one of the things that that you you kind of have as a, a a bedrock mantra is uh, is the idea and concept of of helping enable folks to make better decisions. Absolutely, Michael. Thank you for having me here with you today. It's a real pleasure. Without data, we just have stories, and someone can argue a story to death, but you can't analyze a story. So I need better data. Bring it into the office and analyze as an engineer then take the analysis back out to the field to improve our process. So having live stream data allows me to make decisions while the intervention is going on. So it's critical to our process of improving um, our drill out and making better decisions. So I know, I know, uh, Charles, that that you've uh, talked to to this concept of of utilizing data to to make better decisions, and also have been uh, even uh, featured as a distinguished uh, lecturer uh, within SPE. Um, how, how have you uh, talked about that, and and what's what's your investigations and, and research uh, led you to uh, to find? Oh, thank you for that. Uh, yeah, I traveled around the world during the last Distinguished Lecture series and talked about coil tubing intervention and the importance of data analyzing and improving the process. During the uh, discovery phase, we created a team of 15 uh, completions engineers uh, involved in the coil tubing interventions. We uh, researched with the industry to improve our process and ultimately came out with a recommended best practice, sending data, analyzing it, making better decisions. So uh, maybe maybe to take a step back, I know maybe some folks are saying, okay, you know, maybe I, I I agree, you know, that that data is important and it's something that we need to utilize. But um, you know, I've I've always found that it's important to really have an understanding of the scope of, of a problem before you, you dive into the solution phase. So could you talk a little bit about, uh, you know, how, how, how utilizing data maybe in the, in the space of uh, stuck pipe uh, could, could be something that folks might be interested in? Well, usually you have some indications that you're going to get stuck before you do. So having live streaming data allows you to see the indicators and to react to it before you get stuck. And why is that important? It's important to us because it costs us money. And by preventing the stuck pipe, we're gonna be on the well, off the well quicker. We're gonna make sure that we do not uh, lose our well bore or a portion of our well bore or spend the extra money trying to get our uh, plugs after a plug and perf job drill down. Okay, yeah. And I know that uh, we, we actually, I think have a, a slide that, that talks to uh, that that very problem, and I think that's part of a, a SPE paper that that you were a part of. Uh, I know we'll bring that up. Could you talk a little bit uh, about this particular uh, application or and and the the info behind this paper? I'd be glad to. Uh, so the first question would be uh, how common is stuck pipe? Pipe. Uh, Burgos told us in a study that he did from 2001 to 2010. This is a time when the use of coil tubing is escalating out in the field. There are incidents of stuck pipe actually increased by 43%. You would expect experience to drive failures down, but in this particular case, we found that the failures were increasing. It's because of a lack of understanding of what's happening to our hole down hole there. Um, you have Lindsay uh, in a paper published for British Columbia said that they were stuck on every plug they drilled out for 0.25 hours. There's another operator in Oklahoma from 2013 to 2015, 600 coil tubing interventions where we had electronic data to analyze using big data analytics. Morning reports showed that one well in 17 got stuck. However, when we examined the data, every well had gotten stuck in average of 14 hours. So it's not a rarity. It is the norm. And the assumption here is that you can't do anything to prevent stuck pipe. But that was purely from a lack of understanding of the mechanics of what's happening down home. Right. Okay. Okay. So uh, yeah, I guess I kind of want to give it back over to 
uh, 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 over to Noah. So, you know, Noah, you know, I, I've heard, you know, we've heard what, what Charles has been talking to, especially with uh, the fact that, uh, you know, I'll, you, the expectation would be for an experienced crew, experienced operations that you, you wouldn't have stuck pipe. Uh, but, uh, but as he mentioned, you know, having that lack of visibility down hole certainly was a, a, a contributing factor. So when, when folks, when you talk to, to those that do start to integrate uh, uh, real-time data tools and, and solutions and operations, uh, what are, what's some of the feedback that, that you found that they have? You know, the feedback is, is largely that they need uh, an intelligent piece of uh, communication back to them. Uh, that simply looking at lines and charts is not enough. And uh, we totally agree. Um, and that's why the, the planning tools of Cerberus that uh, we have with the uh, Orpheus uh, tubing forces analysis uh, allows you to overlay that live operations data with your plan and measure whether your plan is going according to uh, how you believed it would, or whether there's a deviation there anywhere along the way. Uh, and where there's a deviation, um, and perhaps an action needs to take place. Uh, and so creating notifications, uh, visualizing that feedback, knowing what the limits of your equipment uh, are in any given working, uh, working circumstance uh, is an important, the important aspect and type of feedback that people want, um, not just to interpolate uh, what they're trying to figure out uh, from looking at the comparisons of that data just generally. So then a, a quick follow-up for you on that. Um, you know, I know that Generally speaking, you know, when when people are looking at integrating uh, a, a change in process, there can be a little bit of a hes hesitation or consideration. So, so as as the solutions, especially those that that you've talked to around Cerberus and other uh, options, have uh, been deployed in the field, how how is what does that process look like, and and what's the response been? Uh, generally speaking, um, the connection of the uh, acquired data on, on site with uh, the CTS or Ryan Net, uh, data acquisition software and with the DAS itself that, that works with uh, servers to give you back these engineering feedback um, uh, actually streamlines a lot of the processes. Um, there's a lot of paper documentation that's going on. Charles referenced how uh, morning reports and sort of uh, general narratives were the, were the common way of a lot of things being communicated. Um, of course, people are taking detailed notes on location. Um, how do we more effectively document that, communicate that back to the office? That's a thing we've created with OrionNet and with a link to the NOV cloud through CTS Live and that UI, um, but also to uh, other third-party customers that may be involved and be stakeholders in these uh, interventions and completions so that they can then uh, see that data coming to them and, and use those same engineering tools and communicate more effectively. Uh, it's more or less uh, reduce the administrative load made uh, communication more clear and uh, been able to enable people to take less risky uh, interventions in general. Mm, okay. Um, so I, I think we'll actually jump back over to, to Charles. So, uh, you know, he, he provided a really good uh, perspective on uh, some of the background uh, in terms of, of understanding uh, kind of a, a, a level set with respect to, to stuck pipe based on some SPE papers that were written. Um, and, and I wanted to to maybe dive in a little bit more on that uh, to to understand you know the idea of of quite simply you know why why is this why is it important why why is this approach important and and, and why should people really truly seriously consider uh, leveraging data for for their operations or to improve operations I suppose. So the why is money and it costs us a lot of money and if we can put that graphic up now, Michael. You'll see that one operator in 2015 spent $60 million on after frack drill out. The average cost was $250,000 per drill out. But if I look at the top 10 failures, they spent $17 million on those 10 wells or $1.7 million per intervention. 30% of all the wells had cost overruns. And the morning report showed that one well in 16 had stuck pipe. Spears and Associates tells us that uh, the coil tubing industry is a $5 billion a year industry. And if I take these statistics and apply it to all of our coil tubing interventions, stuck pipe costs our industry over $1 billion a year. Wow. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I agree with you. I mean, uh, no, no better time than than now with respect to uh, 
uh, in, in improving operations to reduce, reduce expenditure. So that's, that's good insight. Um, I, I know that uh, for those watching, uh, see some comments coming in, so you can continue to have those roll in and we'll be sure to start asking questions for uh, Charles and Noah. So feel free to type those in the comment box and we can start getting to those in just a moment. Uh, so, so Noah, I wanted to to ask you as as you look, uh, especially uh, kind of on the horizon, and, and are looking towards uh, you know solutions and and uh, uh, things that can help increase uh, efficiencies for for customers using using data. What what are some some things that uh, I, I know you can't spill the secret sauce. But generally speaking, what are some things that uh, that that you see as as an opportunity and, and feedback that you're getting from from customers? Of course, and there's a lot of lessons learned in in our uh, partnerships with uh, Charles and, and other companies in the past um, that we've uh, chosen to use as as good starting points to uh, really get into uh, a, a developed product that's out there with uh, uh, condition based maintenance for ISE equipment, intervention and stimulation equipment. Um, that covers coil tubing, wireline, uh, pressure control equipment, and uh, uh, pressure pumping, of course. Um, and we've uh, realized that um, it isn't just driving all of the decisions through operations that also matters. Um, it's including uh, the full system data, uh, including the power plant all the way through the operation of the machine. Um, a procedure needs to be executed in order to get a job done. What's the practical impact of that on machinery, and uh, how does uh, how can training assist with that? So we've got a lot of uh, resources with uh, CBM visualizing that data, reporting on that data, notifying uh, of that data, that system information that goes from essentially the controls all the way through the power plant, the power pack uh, on these pieces of equipment, uh, the things driving this, uh, contextualizing that with operations data. And of course, providing a leading CMMS uh, through NOV's MaxMT that we developed internally that's purpose built for uh, energy and oil field equipment, has tremendous flexibility and capabilities um, and is uh, easy to use, uh, most importantly. Uh, we're not trying to shoehorn you into software that uh, isn't common uh, to this part of the business. Um, and integrate that together because we know, as we've been talking about, uh, some aspect of the narrative is useful the full aspect of the narrative is the most useful. And so bridging all of that stuff together in the uh, Access NOV portal, um, can together with documents, uh, documentation, and reporting, right? Um, probably the most useful thing about any of this information we're collecting is what insights can we get from it and developing those reports and feedback um, so that uh, you're not having to go in and interpret, uh, become a specialist to find out whether it's something important has happened, changed, or needs to be uh, taken action about. Right. Okay. All right. Well, uh, that's really good insight. And uh, I, I wholeheartedly agree. I think that it is uh, definitely important to, to leverage it and and, uh, and uh, be able to utilize it, obviously, for, for increased operations, efficiencies, and, and reduced costs. So uh, I want to go ahead and pivot over to Shelby. It looks like we've got uh, several questions rolling in. I'm looking at the comments now. So uh, we're going to start and uh, see if we can't get to as many of those as, as possible. So what's the first question we have, Shelby? Absolutely, so the first question comes from LinkedIn and Francois wanted to know, how critical is the data that NOV is analyzing? And it's kind of a two part question. Um, does NOV consider that data to be a part of the competitive advantage that we have? Mm, okay, um, so Noah, do you wanna start with that one? Sure, I, I would say that um, number one, we're stewards of data. Uh, we are not the owners of this data. We're, we're the uh, assistance uh, to our customers. Um, and that's first and foremost. Um, is it a competitive edge to us? Well, in terms of it primarily developing competitive edge to our customers and helping them drive a more efficient business, a less risky business, um, and be able to uh, get the most out of uh, the equipment that we build for them that they get to utilize uh, mm -hmm. at the well site. Yeah, no, that, that's a great, great point. I know that we've had uh, all folks within our organization mentioned that that we're we're definitely stewards. So uh, good good reminder. All right, Shelby, uh, what's next? Um, so another question we have is this comes from Tom Morgan, also on LinkedIn, and and he asked, how do you manage data quality from the input? Hmm. Well, it's interesting. There's a couple different ways to look at that. Um, 
Uh, number one is you're looking at the story that that's uh, being told by sensors. You're being you're looking at the uh, story told by uh, the individuals on location. Um, both of those narratives together are more powerful, but um, it isn't that uh, necessarily uh, poorly collected data doesn't tell a useful story itself about uh, where an operational efficiency can be achieved. Um, so uh, the fidelity of it is certainly rock solid. There's no problem there. Um, the stories it tells are the more meaningful thing that you can get in, insights from. And so um, there's not a, a bar to say, well, <clears throat> someone did a certain job of, of adding this much information, but they have more. Even if there's more information, it doesn't necessarily tell a better story. So we're looking at the quality of the insights that we can get from the data and uh, whether, whether it's uh, quality or not um, doesn't necessarily matter. Of course, uh, more properly contextualized information is what the, where the real impact is gained. All right. All right. Thank you. So we have another question. This comes from Ron on LinkedIn. And he was wondering, what is the life cycle of the data? I'd say that that goes as long for as long as anybody can find any useful insight from it. Um, it's, uh, you know, when when major shifts happen in technologies in the oil field and procedures change, then of course you see some uh, uh, whether those those points to call back to and learn from lessons in the past uh, uh, will perhaps be uh, less of a concern to address. But I, I think the important thing with the real time uh, systems that we've developed with CBM, the automation that assists that that goes with uh, our equipment and controls uh, and pressure pumping and and uh, uh, wireline and coil is that um, ultimately. Um, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. <laughs> Uh, um, no problem. Yeah. <laughs> I can go in. I do have another. I have plenty of questions oh, for rolling in. Yeah. Um, we love seeing all, all of those come in. Uh, so this one actually comes from Kim Montgomery, also on LinkedIn. She's wondering beyond that real time data, um, is NOB able to support any data analysis to help make sense of different patterns and trends that that might come up? Yes, we, we offer that um, as a service that's included with uh, our CBM systems um, and uh, uh, data reporting tools, specifically in Access NOV. Um, I'll call back to what I said before about life cycle. Um, ultimately, uh, that data with what's going on with the machine all the way through um, is telling, uh, telling a tremendous story and uh, it's giving you insights in what's impacting that operation that machine in that moment, um, that will never age. Uh, that's important to be able to look at across the entire useful life of that equipment, uh, whether that's planned to be five years, 10 years, and, and hopefully longer. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, thanks, Noah. That was really good insight, and I appreciate you uh, really sharing that info because I know that it's a uh, key, especially now as uh, many operations incorporate uh, digital tools and solutions. So uh, also want to thank uh, Charles Pope, who is the founder of uh, Complete Shale for providing insight and uh, some of his technical uh, expertise. So if you have questions for either one of these gentlemen, uh, you can send an email either to noahbuck at nov.com or you can email Charles Pope, uh, and that's gonna be on the screen as well. I believe that's Charles Pope at completeshale.com, and I'm sure they'd be glad to answer any questions you have. All right, so we are now going to shift over to our new segment uh, again, which is called Ask Assad. All right, so Asad Mahana, the Director of Business Strategy at NOV and one of the guys we go to when we have questions on business strategy and the market. So Asad, good to see you. Pleasure to be here, Michael. So, um, you know, I know that when you are in a position of, of challenge, whether especially in a business sense, uh, whether that's uh, uh, in the energy space or, or honestly, I guess if you look out the window, any any uh, uh, industry, uh, when, when you're faced with challenges like this, I think one of the, the silver linings and things you can look, look towards is innovation and change, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. 
uh, it, it's true. Our industry is going through a pretty pretty tough time, and and you're right, Michael. Crisis can inspire innovation. Uh, and and before before we talk about how it uh, applies in oil and gas, I want I want to quickly mention how COVID nineteen crisis has uh, spurred some unlikely uh, uh, innovation or, or innovation in some unlikely places. Uh, look at look at how quick hospitals were being built in in less than ten days. Um, another good example was additive manufacturing and how the same 3D printers that used to produce airplane parts uh, were being used to produce uh, respiratory masks and ventilators. And last, uh, hand sanitizers. Uh, recipes were being circulated uh, online uh, for homemade hand sanitizer, which is typically uh, uh, grain, alcohol, and aloe vera in, in extremely unlikely places like TikTok. Mm, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. And it, it really is interesting how, like you said, through through those spaces that they, they spun up quickly um, and, you know, obviously through necessity. So so when you start looking at uh, other places and in spaces, um, you know, what are what are some of those those things that you think about and, and how do we maybe wrap a brain around that? Yeah, Michael, if, if we look at what happened the last four or five years ever since the oil industry has been in this in this downturn, um, I think 2015, 2016 is when we saw uh, probably some of the toughest times kind of reminds us of what we're going through today, uh, but also some of the greatest innovations. We're talking with, uh, 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 with, with uh, our groups today on um, what we've seen in the in intervention and stimulation equipment space. Um, and, and those years, you know, look back at the second half of the uh, 2010s, um, uh, whether it was in well depth, uh, in, in, uh, in frac capability, in production from uh, shale wells, uh, the shale industry really boomed in terms of productivity and efficiency. And, and that was all due to people having to think in different ways and come up with new ideas. So uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's fascinating how when the break even needs to be lower, uh, our minds uh, and our technology has to adapt. Okay, so I know that uh, we have a, a graphic that kind of talks about you know the idea of of innovation or or I think some call it ODI. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So uh, the reason why I wanted to bring this up was um, because ODI or outcome driven innovation is a methodology that we use at NOV that's originally been developed by. Uh, Tony Olwick, who's uh, at Stratagen, a uh, an innovation uh, process uh, consulting company, um, and ODI is something that our own Steve Thompson has been using to consult our own businesses within the organization to uh, to steer uh, or and as, as an approach to drive innovation locally. And what ODI says is the first step in winning our future is helping our customers get their job done better. So if we're looking at this graph, what we're really looking at four, maybe five places where you can sit. Um, uh, you could be either doing on, on the Y axis, we're looking at how good of a job you're doing in resolving the problem that your customer needs resolved. Um, and on the X axis, we're looking at how much you're charging for that. If you're if you're living in the in the in the bottom left quadrant, that's discrete growth strategy. And, and that's okay. You could you could uh, you could uh, you could win customers who have limited options. And we're you know think of the stores in airports or Aramark or CashNet USA. Um, and these these are the the, the guys that uh, will deliver a a not so good uh, job done, but also uh, charge more and gain greater margins because of lack of availability. If we move up and and look at who's doing a better job but still charging more. Uh, you're looking at differentiation uh, strategy, and, and that's where you serving uh, the underserved uh, customers. And we're looking at really, uh, you know, bra strong brands like Nest or Nespresso or BMW. Um, if we move to the right, to the bottom right, and that's where disruption lives, uh, you're doing the job less better, less, less than, than, than you would uh, today, uh, but you're also charging less. And this is true. Uh, definition of disruption um, as, as, as we know, disruptive innovation. 
And that's things like TurboTax and E-Trade who have really reinvented how you typically done things um, uh, instead of doing them remotely today. And the top right is when you charge less and still to do the job better and rely on more of a volume uh, dominance of that market uh, with all types of customers that are one. And you're looking at, especially today with Netflix winning all that and, and, and crushing all their competition. The point of this is, you got to make a choice. Most of the companies today probably live in that space in the very middle where you're doing it slightly better, slightly cheaper. Things were good. Uh, there was enough market out there to feed everybody. But the decision that companies need to make today is how good of a job do you need to do and how much do you want to charge for it uh, so that you identify your business strategy going forward. Interesting. No, that's that's really uh, good insight and good food for thought. Uh, you know, as we look look at those industries, and of course, can apply it uh, in the energy industry as well. So, good uh, good insights and perspectives on uh, innovation uh, in this market and beyond. So, appreciate it. Been talking with Asad Mahana, the director of business strategy here at NOV. Thanks, Mike. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and shift over to Shelby Dumain again to help wrap us up and give us the Rig Geeks post of the week uh, answers. Absolutely, Michael. And um, I'm gonna repeat the question again and, I, and I'm gonna make a, a clarification because some of our Rig Geeks on LinkedIn, um, exactly, exactly what I love to see, they, they were asking some a little bit more detail to get a little bit more exact on that link. So the question we asked was, what is the average length of a coiled tubing string? And um, I wanted to clarify that the, the OD we're talking about is two and five eighths inches. Uh, so some people wanted, wanted that little detail to maybe get a little bit more exact on that average length of a coiled tubing uh, string. So before I reveal the answer, I wanted to actually ask our guests, Noah and Charles, uh, Charles, do you have any uh, get guesses about the average length of a cold tubing string? They, they can just do some quick math. So two and five eighths inches, uh, average length. Uh, we'll, yeah. we'll 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 go with you, Charles. I, I think uh, you 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 you've got a lot of books on your shelf, so surely you can just uh, whip this <laughs> off the top of your head. Let me turn around and grab one. If it was two inch, I was going to say twenty three thousand, but two and five eighths, maybe uh, twenty one thousand feet. All right. All right. We got, got a little going? freeboard on that reel. I'm going to guess uh, 21.5. Uh, Y'all are both very close. So the answer is the average length of a cold tubing string is 25,000 feet. Ah. Uh, yeah. And we also have, as a little bonus, um, the weight of that is 140,000 pounds. So cool. Very nice. Interesting equipment. Um, All so right. Our Rig Geek Post of the Week. Uh, I did want to mention um before before I, I hand it back over to you um that the i wouldn't be i wouldn't be a, a good social media manager if i didn't mention next week we are doing nov live international uh so instead of our normal show where we come on here every wednesday at 11 we're actually going to be going live every day next week i'm um, about four to five times per day we're going to talk to a lot of really great experts about tech all across the industry um, normally this is the time of year when everybody in our industry is gathering in houston and since we can't do that this year, we still wanted to bring you that same level of discussion uh, here on NOV's channels. That's uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to next week. I think it's going to be a, a great set of shows. Absolutely. Yeah, looking forward to it. Yeah, there'll be a lot of great conversation, experts, and uh, some really good insights. So uh, yeah, all, all week next week. So thanks, Shelby. Really appreciate that. And a uh, special thank you to... Uh, again, Noah Buck and Charles Pope for joining us today. Really appreciate your insight and uh, and feedback. And again, if you need or have questions on anything that we talked about today that we weren't able to cover, if we didn't get to your question, uh, you can send an email to noah.buck at nov.com or you can reach out to Charles Pope. And that's going to be Charles Pope at uh, completeshale.com. And we'll be sure to put those emails on the screen. So uh, for all of us here at NOV, thank you so much for joining us. And again, look forward to seeing you next week for a special NOV Live International all week. So be sure to find more information on our LinkedIn pages and uh, also our, our other social platforms on Twitter 
And uh, you can also find info on Instagram. So we'll be here live all next week for NOV Live International. So thanks for joining us and uh, look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks for tuning in. We'll talk to you later.